Um, this is a, a difficult assignment for me because uh, um, I actually get this request from clients all the time. How should we be coding our COBOL programs? And uh, I've looked around the internet and there really isn't a, a common set of rules that everyone should follow. So I kind of just started writing things, uh, ideas that I had. And uh, hopefully they'll be helpful. I, have, I don't have very much, so we'll be able to get ahead of schedule on, uh, on, our, on our day here. Okay. So uh, the first thing for me is that uh, I know when I'm looking at code that someone else wrote, and I don't quite understand uh, what they're doing, or more importantly, uh, why they did something a certain way. And sometimes it's very important that there was a really good reason why they did something that they did, but they didn't put it in comments. And so I might change it and then rediscover the whole problem that was solved five years ago by someone else. So I think one of the most important parts of good programming is to tell whoever is going to look at this code after you what you're doing. Um, so. And this is a standard kind of COBOL block comment, and I like having the line, the, the, the documentation separated out from the code myself. There's, everybody has a different style, and so I'm kind of uncomfortable to tell you what I think you should do. <laughs> you do uh, what you like, but I like to have a line of asterisk to say, here is something that's not code, and it hopefully will help me understand this piece I'm working on. And then you can have comments uh, on the same line as COBOL, starting with COBOL version 5.1, uh, just like you can do in C and PL1 and Assembler. Uh, now you can do it in COBOL, so I can have a comment on the same line. And so it might say something like, uh, this variable looks like it's not initialized, but it really is, and it's initialized in a hidden way that you can't see by looking at this program. So for me, I've wanted this many, many times. And we actually have a whole bunch of uh, documentation within IBM uh, about each APAR fix that we, does everyone know what an APAR is? Uh, that's like a, a defect in an IBM product. If you call up IBM and say, my COBOL program got the wrong answer for this math. And <clears throat> we say, oops, you're right. We made a mistake. We open a problem and it's called an APAR. And then when we fix it, you get a PTF. Very, uh, if, you're, if you work with service, you know about these things. Well, <clears throat> every APAR has a story behind it. And we have a, a database of information so that I can go later and, and look at, now why did we do this change this way? And I can look 10 years ago and see the description of what was done to fix an APAR fix. And it's so valuable to have something to read about the code and learn about it. Uh, especially as I get older, I can't really remember what I had for lunch yesterday, much less what code I wrote yet last year. <clears throat> Another uh, nice thing to do is initialize variables. Um, in the United States, many COBOL programs won't run unless they run with the runtime option storage 00, zero because they <clears throat> had a hangover uh, leftover behavior from the days pre-reentrant uh, COBOL. When a program was loaded, the loader would load the program into an area that was zeroed out. So it happened, it just so happened that working storage had all binary zeros. And uh, unfortunately I'm seeing that a lot of things that just happened become dependent upon by our customers. So we had to add um, WS clear in VS COBOL 2, I don't know if anyone remembers that, the VS COBOL 2 runtime had an option clear my working storage and now in the language environment we have a runtime option storage and the first parameter says zero out heap storage which is where working storage is acquired. But this is expensive and it's also not a good value. It's zero, binary zeros doesn't make sense for an alphanumeric data item that should have spaces in it. <coughs> so the much better thing to do is to not do this, run with storage none, get better performance, and for each variable that needs a value in it before we <coughs> use it, set it one way or another. 
value clause is traditional, but it only happens when you first enter the program. Move, computer, set, and initialize can be uh, in a paragraph, like reinitialize this program, set all the data back to the initial state. Um, and then there's a, a new thing coming in the next release, I'm calling it vnext, so I don't <laughs> pre-announce anything. But, um, and this is from the standard, we're going to have initialize uh, a variable, uh, all of the items in it, to the value clause that they had. So now I, if I have value clauses on a, on a structure, on different fields in an O1 level group, I can say reset it to the original values in my value clause, as if I just entered my program for the first time. Kind of cool. So this can be rerun as well. So I don't know if that's you. I mean, it's, some of this stuff is really kind of obvious, so uh, I don't know if it's helpful or not. I hope it is. <laughs> um, make your code readable. I, uh, I personally prefer indented uh, code, and I like indenting two characters, because it's more obvious than one. And if you indent too much, you run out of your 72 mm -hmm. character line. So, uh, and then this is sort of a performance kind of a thing. Whenever, um, another thing that people want to hear about is improving the performance of their COBOL programs. And there's compiler options you can do, and there's little tricks here and there. But these things make small percentage differences, whereas like, I have uh, cases where uh, in a loop, the customer would open and close the file over and over again, and then read it, open it, read a record, close, open, read a record, close. And so just by redesigning the I.O., the program became 90% more efficient. So the, the actual arithmetic and calculations don't mean anything if my I.O. is inefficient. So that's the, the biggest place in your code that you can get performance improvements is to avoid re-accessing data if you can. Uh, and then I talked about this earlier, uh, for record is varying depending on, this is the best way to code uh, for variable length record processing. And there's several things good about it. One of them is that you instantly have access to the length of each record that was read and you don't have to back up and use the trick in, in QSAM that people would do, you uh, go before the beginning of the record and actually access the length field, um, which is not a documented interface. This is a completely documented, perfectly supported interface to get the length of the record. So, <clears throat> for record is varying, this is my example from earlier, where I had 5 to 40 in my record clause, and, but my record descriptions were 10 to 30. So it should either be 10 to 30 in the record clause or 5 to 40 in, the, in my data descriptions. And we now put out a warning message in the compiler if you do this. These would not get warning messages. <clears throat> also, when I read uh, my file one, <clears throat> with record is varying depending on x, um, if I get a record, then I can display it easily, uh, access the length of the record <clears throat> in my record is varying depending on variable. <clears throat> Um, so, data division. Avoid usage display data items if you can. <clears throat> These should only be used for display. <laughs> what do you know? Usage display or reading dumps. This, these are numeric variables that you can see when they're even in their hex form or if you're looking in ISPF at a dump or something. But they're terrible for performance. So, with the compiler will do what it can. It will convert them to pack decimal or decimal floating point to make it faster, but if you can avoid that, then you can get much better performing code. I like using the uh, new <laughs> 1985 standard names for data types. Instead of comp or comp4, <clears throat> not very many people have memorized the secret, you know, what's comp and comp1 and comp3 and comp5? It's just not very helpful. But binary, I understand right away, so I think it's, it's, it's better to do, use the word binary instead of one of its synonyms. <clears throat> now there is a case of comp5 has a separate meaning, 
if you use the truncation option opt, then you want to use comp five, which says apply the trunk bin compiler option to this guy, even though I'm compiling with trunk opt. <clears throat> what does, uh, do you have a standard here in COBOL for the truncation option? Does anyone know what it is? I don't know. But I don't think we use that. I think that the uh, COP5 is just like COP4 and COP. So it looks the same. Yeah. So you probably have trunk bin. Yeah. That's the most common that people use. Um, but I just wanted to check with you all. And then uh, always define the largest number of digits for the size. With trunk bin, you always get to use the whole field anyway. You can use all the bits in a half word and a full word. So it doesn't really make sense to say pick 9-1 you're getting pick nine, four and a half. You can have 32,000, even though it's pick nine, one. So, uh, and this is just for documentation and readability. Um, I, think, I think it's confusing to have uh, a variable that's defined with just a few digits, but it's, uh, you're using all of them. Uh, and then, of course, you know, sign or no sign doesn't really matter. And uh, similarly, instead of comp three, uh, use the, the pack decimal. It's more characters, but it's very readable. And then always use an odd number of digits for pack decimal data items. Don't, uh, the, the compiler will allocate the, the extra nibble anyway, so you might as well use it, name it. And that, uh, even, uh, odd number can be an uh, even number of decimals in one uh, uh, integer or whatever combination that the nines add up to. There should be an even number of them. So either an even number of integer or a decimal with, you know, add the decimals and, and integers together to get even. All right, um, another thing, and this is, uh, this is kind of old school, but um, CICS changed their, uh, their precompiler a while back to do this because they had unprintable strings as a value in some of the generated code from us, uh, exact kick statements. And what can happen is uh, if you use any tools like RDZ or things that upload and download code from the mainframe to Windows, then this stuff will get corrupted. Uh, so you can do that. This is actually what on my screen it looked like when I put 0EZ990 Fox. Uh, it was just a, a string of unprintable characters. And I can see exactly what the values are if I use my hex literal. So do you use hex literals here at all? Be good. So you can use them in move statements or value clauses. Um, and this is a, 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 a piece of code that um, I was working at a, at a bank that used both COBOL and PO1, and they were trying to rewrite some of their PO1 into COBOL. And they found that they didn't have a good uh, version of this uh, PO1, I think it's verify function. And they coded uh, this code to do a verify of a date field that could have digits and periods, uh, or decimal points, whatever we want to call them. So what they did is they uh, moved the text into a temporary, changed the periods to zeros, and then did the numeric class test to see if we ended up with all numerics. Um, it worked, but it wasn't very fast. And there's a, a trick that a lot of people don't know about. I can write my own class test in COBOL. In my special names clause, I can create a class like verify date and say that uh, something is valid in this clause if it has the, the, the characters 0 through 9 or period. And then in my, uh, my procedure division, I can just say, if text 1 is not VDATE, then, and this is much more efficient and, uh, and, and easier to, I think it's easier to read, but I don't know how often people use the class clause of the uh, special names clause in their COBOL program. But you can create your own uh, validation of data. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> use end if, don't use a period. <laughs> and here's my new comment style again. Um, handling invalid data. This is a really popular topic now that people are discovering, discovering that they have invalid data as they migrate to COBOL version 5 and get different results from running their programs. Um, so, sort of 
Fab Data 101 is whenever data comes into a program, it should be checked, ideally, with a numeric class test or a, or a user-written class test or some kind of a test to see, did the, the user enter something valid in my kicks panel or did they accidentally type garbage? And what am I going to do? Am I going to depend on an ab end or do I want to fix it up and give them a nice error message and say uh, that it's wrong? Now, this kind of stuff now with uh, with JavaScript and, and a lot of the, the validation is done before it even gets to the COBOL program. It's done by the user interface, but still, somehow bad data is getting into my users' COBOL programs and giving them uh, trouble in their COBOL version 5 migration. So wherever the data comes from, we need to validate it. Now, this can take a little bit of extra processing, so you need to make a decision about do I want this to perform and take a risk on bad data, or do I want to make sure that I always have good data and always get the right answer? Um, one thing you can do is code for performance and assume good data, and then if you get an ab end at runtime, you can write a user-written condition handler. It's good because the faster execution of your code, because you're not checking your data over and over, especially if you only have bad data one out of one million times, you did 999,000 checks for, for, with no benefit from it. Um, so it's faster. And you don't have to rerun an entire job. If you have one bad record or one bad uh, piece of data after processing one million, you can complete the execution and then have a report afterwards that says, this one customer uh, uh, row had a, had a flaw in it and you need to process it by hand. So I don't have to rerun the entire job. The bad is, and, uh, and I'm hearing about this more and more with COBOL version 5, is that people unfortunately rely on their code ab ending with bad data. And what that means is that we're assuming that the co compiler is going to do something that maybe it won't do. Um, for example, um, I, I talked to a financial corporation just at the last share in the United States, and then I mentioned that you shouldn't rely on admin behavior. They have a data item called bomb, and they move spaces into it. It's packed decimal. And they get spaces into it, and then whenever they want an admin, they do add one to bomb, uh, which is <laughs> not very clear reading the code. That, you know, really what I want to do is admin right here. Everything's screwed up, so let's get it done. Um, the right way to get an ab end is, does anybody know? The correct documented way to get an ab end in COBOL and PO1 is call CE3 ab end. <laughs> call a routine that says, I want to ab end. And it's completely supported by IBM and will work the same with every compiler for the next 100 years. Whereas <laughs> add one to bad pack decimal might not ab end if you did a decimal floating point instruction. It'll ab end if you do a pack decimal instruction, but those are slow. So, um, <clears throat> assuming that bad data will be handled by instructions is not good programming, especially now that we're changing what we do under the covers for you in the, in the compilers. <clears throat> so, on entry to a program, I could use a numeric class test if something is numeric. Um, this new compiler option that we added to COBOL version 5 as a result of customers uh, having bad data in their zone decimal data items, zone check will automatically generate a numeric class test for every numeric display variable that is used as a sender, as a source of data in a program. And then if I compile with no zone check, we take them out again. So I can validate everything in my program with this compiler option and run very, very slow, of course. Once I know all my data is good, I would turn back to no zone check and have very performant code, but I know I don't have bad data now. So this is kind of a nice, uh, you can do this up front, and once you're certain that you know that there's no bad data coming into your program, or you know where it's coming and you add a specific class test at that point, then you can turn this off. It's kind of a, I think it's a powerful tool. 
And then you might also, for numeric variables, you might have valid numeric data, but it's got the wrong values in it, like the, a year value that, that doesn't map to you know, year 3000 or something. It doesn't make any sense. Alphabetic data, you can use an alphabetic class test. So similarly to numeric, you can say if XYZ is alphabetic, and it will make sure it's got all the characters in it. Unfortunately, it only works for the 26 letters in the COBOL set, and so it might not apply in uh, Denmark. Uh, but you could write your own user-defined class in the special names paragraph for, for other letters. And then alphanumeric data, use a user-defined uh, class, or write your own validation in line with inspect or that kind of a COBOL statement, or if you evaluate. <coughs> so, Catching happens with a user written condition handler. Does anyone do this in COBOL here? User written condition handlers? Anybody know? Um, <clears throat> so, I've already talked about this. You should never rely on bad data getting happens because it might not in the next release of COBOL. And so, suddenly the compiler, thinking it's generating better code for you, gives you the wrong answers in your program. But there is a way to handle happens. And that is a user written condition handler. And the way you do that is uh, first I uh, register the name of my uh, condition handler, and I'm going to call it handler. And I'm going to set my user handler, which is a procedure pointer, to, uh, to point to handler, or to refer to handler. And then I'm going to call a service similar to the call CE3Admin to get an admin. Uh, these are the LE callable services. There's a whole bunch of them, a giant book full of these things. And this one says, register a condition handler. And I'm going to pass the, the name of the condition handler to it, and a token, and, a, and I'm not passing a third parameter. So uh, now if I get a divide by zero here, and I do have divisor set to zero, so uh, divide by zero will still get an app, and I believe in any data type? That's a good question. I'm going to have to research this. <laughs> but uh, when I write this test case, I get an add end here. And what happens is uh, the admin gets trapped by the runtime, and it, and it says, is there a condition handler, or am I just going to go straight to uh, admin processing? And if there's a condition handler, it turns controller over to this program. And now this program could write a report of what was going wrong, what we were doing at the time of the error, uh, or send a message to someone, and then it can also do resume and go back to the program and go to the next record or the next row that we're processing in the SQL table. Could be useful. Uh, this is a, a feature in, in COBOL 5 that says uh, this variable should not be optimized, even though I'm, uh, I think I talked about this earlier, can't remember now. Uh, the optimizer says, I'm setting step to two here, but then I set it to three before I use it, so I'm not going to do that set at all. I'm not going to set step to, to two, because I can't see any use for it. But the optimizer doesn't know that in my condition handler, where I can get control here, I actually use the variable. It's an external variable, so I can refer to it outside of the program. Volatile says, no matter what, don't optimize this variable. So you think you should optimize here, but I'm telling you not to. So it gives you control over the optimizer to, to rein it in, slow it down. Um, we recommend, especially for moving to COBOL version 5, uh, compiling twice. When you first move to version 5, compile with SS range and zone check and see if you get any SS range or zone check errors. If you don't, then there's a really good chance you, your program has all valid data and you'll get the same results in version 5 as you did in version 4. If you do have problems, there's a really good chance you're going to get different results in version 5, so you want to fix these. You want to fix your subscript range problems. This SS range has been around for 30 years or so. I was talking to a customer two weeks ago, and she said, well, I've been coding COBOL for 30 years. I've never heard of SS range. When did you add that? And I said, 1983. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
So this has been around a long time. This has been around for one, uh, less than a year. But both of these are good tools to uh, ensure that you have a well-written program or that the data that your program is processing is what it should be. <clears throat> so uh, we're using the term invalid COBOL, or I am, and we should probably say invalid COBOL data because um, if your code passes these tests, I mean, it could be valid COBOL with bad data, which makes it invalid, but so it's invalid COBOL data, it might be more of a, a clear term. And uh, programs with invalid COBOL data are going to create problems for you forever and ever because the next version of COBOL will generate more different instructions and reveal more of these problems. So uh, I think this is just a good idea in general at unit test time to make sure you're, you're writing, uh, you're, you're processing correct data in your COBOL program. Then, of course, turn these off for production because they generate a whole bunch of extra code. Uh, I have talked to customers who, uh, uh, it's more of an IMS online problem, but one program can go <clears throat> right past the end of the table and, and go all the way down into overwriting another program. So program A is bad and it crashes program B. Program B is perfect and yet it keeps abetting and you can't figure out why. And so these customers will run, have been running with SS range in production for years. It's slower, but it's safer. So instead of uh, a program that's out of control corrupting another program, it abends itself and sticks to itself and doesn't affect its neighbors. <clears throat> so uh, you can use these in production, but I recommend not. It's, they're very slow. And then uh, something that uh, we just recently as we um, merged with the compiler teams in Toronto for COBOL and PL1, uh, we started using RTC in IBM to automate build and test. So now I can make changes to the compiler and say build the compiler and run a complete regression test and it's just a couple of commands. It's really, really cool. So it makes it uh, super easy to test my changes. And, uh, and before we had the ability to test and build, but it, it took, uh, I would say, I could spend sometimes an hour trying to build my compiler to test and then setting up my test environment. Now it takes uh, seconds. I just say build, test, and just like that, and it just everything goes really fast. And it also makes it very easy to run different compiler options. So I can say build and test with these options. Now test with the other options. And very little work on my part, a lot of work on the machine. The machine's doing all kinds of testing under, you know, for me. But as a developer, um, it's very efficient. So I highly recommend, are you using uh, RDZ or RTC and all those things? Good, the DevOps, yeah. I, I'm really uh, impressed. Sometimes when IBM comes out with new things, I think, yeah, okay, here's another, another fantastic solution that we're selling our customers. But in this case, I honestly use this, and I honestly think it's really cool, so I'm sharing it with you. You will have a beer in the bar afterwards. Okay. <laughs> uh, read the F manual. Uh, in IBM, we have one word we use for F. But in public, I say, read the friendly manual. <laughs> because it drives me crazy. Uh, and we're finding again, and I've been saying this for 20 years, but now that I'm having my customers run into trouble because they assumed that when they tried something and they saw a certain behavior from the compiler, they thought, OK, I can rely on this forever. Did I check the manual? No, I just, I just saw the behavior and I'm going to design my whole application based on that. Uh, and I know this is a pain, but, uh, and I don't know a way around this, but if a manual says that you'll get an ab end adding one to a packed decimal data item that has spaces in it, then you can count on it. But you will not find that in any manual. <laughs> that is not valid coding. So, when a customer calls IBM and says the COBOL compiler is doing the wrong thing, I always say, okay, 
show me in the manual where it says what it should do and why you think it's doing the wrong thing. And quite often they say, well, I, don't, I can't find that documented anywhere. Okay, well then, maybe that's not documented behavior and you can't open a problem about it. That's, and in this case, invalid data, the results are um, specifically laid out in the COBOL manual as unpredictable. So you might get an admin and you might not. So adding one to a bad fact decimal data item sometimes gets an admin and maybe it won't. So I don't know, does anybody use this trick here? No? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I have uh, the, the company in the US I was talking to last month. They have tons of applications relying on this behavior. And it's just, uh, I don't know what to do. <clears throat> good, so I'm glad to hear your, uh, so here's the specific, here's how you, how you do this corrupting thing. Move spaces to my alphanumeric, redefine it, and then add one. And <clears throat> you might get the compiler to generate a packed instruction and add them, and you might not. That's all I had. <laughs> Any questions? Suggestions for improvement? <laughs> Do you have resources of places that tell you how to write good COBOL programs? I'd, I'd be interested to know myself too. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.